up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to the SI Sooners podcast. You know, since we last spoke to you guys, um, wow, okay, Ramondre Stevenson leaves for the NFL. Ronnie Perkins leaves for the NFL. Now, Nick Benito, he came back. Um, Spencer Jones won the Hottie Award. That's the holder of the year. It's a funny little thing. Laugh at it. It's funny. Just do it. Uh, check it out at allsooners.com. You know what else? Big news. Lincoln Riley, the new coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. Wait. Not, he's not the coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, but we'll probably get to that later. Don't worry about it. We have debuted a new series every day at allsooners.com. We're breaking down one position group and handing out report cards for the 2020 season. And Ryan, we got a lot more coming, but uh, tell us about that. Tell us about your report card so far. Yeah, for sure, John. Right now, we've gotten through. The defense, uh, we'll be doing special teams here on Thursday, then we'll move on into the offense. But, John, I think it's been a lot of fun, and it's it's nice being able to go back in and break things down and segment it. There's so much talk about this defense as a whole, but now we get to go in and do some analysis. Hey, the, you know, the entire defense played really well on the back end of the season. Was that up to the defensive line? Was it the secondary? What position groups need to take that leap forward if the Sooners want to achieve their goals next year and win a national title? Um, all of that wrapped into it. You're involved. We've had one major disagreement on the linebackers, so go ahead and... Go check that out at Johnny Hoover at Radio is Ryan. Let us know who you think is right and why. But we've got the whole other side of the football, the offense coming for you. So allsooners.com got something every morning. Every day, something new. That's Ryan Chapman. He's in Norman. I'm John Hoover. I'm in Tulsa. Appreciate you guys, as always, listening to the SI Sooners podcast. I um, want to thank you for watching on my YouTube channel. Here at SI Sooners, we are a Fan Nation affiliate, part of the Sports Illustrated Network, and you can always find every day what Ryan and I and others are writing about the Sooners. Uh, again, literally every day. Guys, we had 10 stories posted two days ago. Yesterday, a little bit of an off day. We only had eight new stories posted, so everything's got a video attached to it. we got content on content on content, SI Sooners, allsooners.com. So, Alabama is the king of the land. Nick Saban is the GOAT, obviously. Seven freaking national titles. Do you believe that? Um, Devontae Smith is the man. Whoa. Uh, Najee Harris, he's the beast, I guess. That defense played amazing. Christian Barmore, all that. Ryan, I want to ask you, based on that Alabama team that you saw on Monday night in Miami, how close is Oklahoma to being that team? To, to being able to go toe-to-toe with a team like that. Uh, Remember, that was just the second one of Nick Saban's teams that went undefeated. So that's saying something. This this Oklahoma team in 2021, Ryan, are they even close to that level? Yeah, it's kind of hard, John, just because, you know, Um, We won't actually get to compare the two teams side by side next year because Alabama's going to lose so much. But if you just roll down it like offensively, record-setting offense, but if you're looking at it, Spencer Rattler probably has a much higher ceiling than Mac Jones has. So that's one area, a very important area. I don't know if the Sooners have a running back that can reach Najee Harris's potential, but they do have that tight end H back room that, that's used kind of unlike any other grouping in the country. So what, what I think it would boil down to is could the Sooners replicate that high level of play up front, that Alabama offensive line, get, uh, Joe Moore winners there. That's where I think, the huge difference is because you look everywhere else on the offense, John, oh, has got five, uh, five star, um, you know, t- SI top 1000 wide receivers out the wazoo. Uh, so like those guys should be able to come along. So that offensive line and then you flip it over. The defense has come a long way. Sure. But I- I'm not sure there's a Sertan on this defense. I- I'm not sure there's anyone on that defensive line that really looks like what Alabama looks like. They've obviously, the Sooners, gotten that kind of production this year. So I I think they're still a year or two away of defensive recruiting to roll that all through because because the guys they're bringing on campus just look different than what they have right now in Oklahoma. So I think that you're still two or three years away. It's just a pity because the timelines just aren't going to line up, John, where we can like truly compare these two high-powered football teams side by side but you know the Sooners aren't necessarily that far off it's really just the trenches I feel like where they where they lack and trail behind the Crimson Tide yeah they they might be able to make up some ground in 2021 but if we're talking 2021 and comparing it to what we just saw identifying it as that's the national championship team here's why I say no Oklahoma's not on that level oh you just lost five guys to the transfer portal 
all good depth guys, every one of them. And they also lost six guys to the NFL draft. So that really, really sets back this team for a national title hunt next year. They need that talent. They need that depth. That's a lot of guys walking out the door, right? Well, guess what? Alabama's going to lose four underclassmen for sure, probably more closer to twice that. Plus all those seniors that could come back next year, guess what? They're going to the league. I think Todd McShay said that this team has six first-rounders in this year's draft. I'm not sure Oklahoma has six first-rounders on the whole team in 2021, much less in that junior and senior class draft eligible. Do they? I mean, they've got some talent coming in, but here's the deal. You cannot project which freshmen are going to be first-round guys. You just can't. Um, you know what else? Alabama's got the number one recruiting class in 2021. They had the number two recruiting class in 2020, and they had the number one recruiting class in 2019. You know what Oklahoma's class rankings were those three years? Number six, number 12, and number 10. Those things matter. I know. Listen, you can make an argument. Now, the talent gap, I think, is getting bigger based on that, not smaller. And don't misunderstand me. I think OU is going to be outstanding really good in 2021. I think they're going to win the Big 12. I think they're going to get back to the playoff, and I think they have a chance to win the, the playoff game for the first time ever. And I also think that the, that 20 class and that 21 class coming in, I think those guys are really good, and they're going to be great football players. But are they going to win a national championship game? Are they going to be what we saw Monday night? Um, I'm not sure. Are they, go, are they going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that Alabama team and say, we're better. Uh, I, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying, oh, you can't win a national championship, but it's going to be really, really hard. Ryan, I want to talk about TV ratings. Wah, wah. After all that, I want to talk about TV ratings, and this is important here. The ratings for the Monday night game were 18.7 million. The, not the ratings, but the viewership for the, for the, the uh, game Monday night, 18.7 million. Do you know that's the lowest in the playoff era? And it's also the lowest in the BCS era. The previous low, believe it or not, was USC number one, Oklahoma number two in the Orange Bowl 2004 season. Yeah, 55-19. This year's national championship game, the viewership was lower than the this year's semifinals. It's literally the two biggest brands in the game and nobody watches. Ryan, what does that say? Well, I think it says, first off, um, we have a sports calendar that we're all very used to during the season, John. I know it gets thrown out during bowl season, and that's one of the magical times where, you know, a lot of people are home, stuff like that. But maybe the college football playoff and the committee and whoever sets these dates might dip back in and say college football is played on Saturdays when people don't have to get up and go to work the next morning for the most part. Um, maybe instead of, hiding the national championship game on a Monday night when, uh, unless you're looking for it, it's not intuitive. You shouldn't do that. But also I, I think it just kind of speaks to the fact that John, I, by no means do not mistake me. Am I saying we need to go back to the old days where it's just the polls, nothing else, no guarantee. But looking back, we know the narrative about the playoff. There's not a ton of competitive playoff games but if you go through the BCS era, how many real amazing like national championship games were there too? Like it, it, it's not always a given that when the two best teams line up on the field on any given night that you're going to get a great game. Are there two great teams? Yes, great talent. But on a Monday night, people got to go to work. They just had the super wild card weekend, bonanza, whatever, Nickelodeon slime, all of that. Like if you have all of that, why am I going to stay up on a Monday night, even if it's Ohio State and Alabama, to watch the Crimson Tide boat race somebody? Like, I'm just not going to do it. So I think they need to readjust. Like, this is what college football is. Put it back on a Saturday night. People will know it. People don't have other stuff going on. And as far as the competitiveness goes, like, that's just hit or miss. It's something we've dealt with for the better part of 20 years. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I think maybe it also says that people are tired of the same three to four schools in the in the title game every year. Um, and maybe it says that the playoff committee, w you know, will either start considering other teams, maybe. And, you know, when they do their rankings, when they do their final rankings, whatever, like Cincinnati this year, like Boise State or UCF and other years. I think maybe us also it might say that, uh, you know, 2021, if you think about it, the playoff is about a year away from announcing that 
in my guess anyway, not reporting anything new here, but I'm guessing that they're going to expand the playoff field. It's 2021. And remember, there are TV contracts coming up in the Big Ten in 2023, the Pac-12 in 2024, the Big 12 in 2025. That's the same year the playoff contract expires. So you put all that together. And of course, listen, the networks and the conferences, they're not going to let anything, any of these contracts expire, right, before they actually have a new deal on the table. So just keep an eye out. That's going to that's gonna start filtering out news and developments in that area are going to start filtering out probably later this calendar year or possibly early in 2022. Um, you might see some minor realignment when that comes. And of, of course, when you start having minor realignment, all the fish start jumping and pretty soon it becomes major realignment. So who knows? Uh, but here's the deal. Once we get past this COVID, once we get, you know, know what the basketball tournament's going to make this year, uh, once everybody figures out a way to either manage or mitigate their financial losses in 2020, I think that's when you're going to start hearing about TV contracts, possible realignment fallout, maybe, maybe a little bit. Um, COVID, I want to say COVID looks bad. The recession looks bad. Nobody wants to spend any money. But guess what? Just last month, ESPN took over the SEC's exclusive broadcast rights of for the for the SEC. No more SEC on CBS starting in 2024. They signed a 10-year contract, and it's been reported that ESPN is going to pay those guys $300 million a year. So trust me, folks, COVID, empty stadiums, economic crisis, furloughs, layoffs, small businesses shutting down, big businesses making cuts. TV ain't going nowhere. This is happening. Um, Ryan, speaking of the championship game, how heartbreaking was that to watch Trey Sermon? Broke his collarbone on the first snap, played one more play, and he's done they get their doors blown off. Not saying that he would have won the game for them, but not that Alabama team anyway. But dude was playing so great. You just hate to see it. Yeah, and it's like we kind of talked about this. And you wrote about it. How many guys leave a place like Oklahoma and are afforded not just a, a second chance to be a key player at, at such a big program, but second life and getting to a national championship game, chasing that dream, things like that on top of fighting through this offseason what it was, Sermon wasn't getting much run at all the first half of the season, and he comes on strong there toward the end. I, I think that, you know, everyone was right there with us and just like, God, to have that taken away. Can you imagine working and working and working for that moment and then, you know, two plays in, just getting that taken from you, nothing malicious, anything like that, but that's just the way it rolls. It's awful, but uh, Trey Sermon, you know, seems to have a good head on him, and and I'm sure that he'll come back from this, and, and it'll be a, a just another, you know, data point, another chapter in this really amazing journey that Trey Sermon's been on in college football before he inevitably takes that next step and heads to the NFL. Up next on the SI Sooners podcast, Fly Lincoln Fly? Hey, listen up. Winter's here, okay? But you know the season's in Oklahoma. Cold one day, hot the next. That's a lot of work for your heating and air unit. But the guys at Trade Pros, they got you covered. Sign up for one of their no-hassle service plans. You can go pro, become elite, or the best deals, the MVC, most valuable customer. They'll come out twice a year and tune up your AC and your furnace. You get priority scheduling and you get additional discounts. Just call Caleb or Carrie at Trade Pros, 405-249-7290, or go to tradeprosokc.com or look them up on Facebook. Trade Pros. That's one word. Trade Pros. Heat and air. Follow SI Sooners on Twitter at all underscore Sooners. Find Ryan at Radio's Ryan and I'm at John E. Hoover. Our website is allsooners.com. Again, we are a Fan Nation affiliate. That's part of the Sports Illustrated Network. All of our content is free. No memberships, no subscriptions, no credit cards. Just click and enjoy. And uh, you guys can always find the video version of this podcast over on my YouTube channel, John Hoover Media. Please remember, subscribe to that other channel right here. Okay. Ryan, it was reported this week that Lincoln Riley has been contacted by the Philadelphia Eagles after General Manager Howie Roseman made the decision to fire Doug Peterson. Um, they like Lincoln. Listen, everybody likes Lincoln. He just conducts himself the right way. And I doubt there's literally anybody in the NFL who can say, I don't like that Lincoln Riley. So 
The Eagles, it's been reported that they leaned heavily on Lincoln's input before they drafted Jalen Rager, the wide receiver out of TCU. And of course, they relied heavily on Lincoln, as you can imagine, before they drafted Jalen Hurts, the quarterback out of Oklahoma via Alabama. So yeah, the Eagles have obviously struck up a professional relationship with Lincoln Riley. I'm sure a lot of teams probably have, but guess what, Howie? He ain't going to Philly. I mean, nice try, but Ryan, he's going to stick around in Norman for a little bit longer, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And look, it's a weird situation that Lincoln Riley's actually been in as if you're to believe the reports, he's had the opportunity to take over in Cleveland and reunite with Baker Mayfield in Arizona and reunite with Kyler Murray. And now, you know, being contacted for this job, look, nothing against Jalen Hurts, but if Lincoln Riley was going to jump ship and head to the NFL and start anew, wouldn't you think it would have been with either Baker or Kyler as opposed to Jalen just because they kind of jive a lot more with the offense that he wants to run. Now, he's obviously such a gifted offensive mind. We saw Jalen Hurts succeed, uh, you know, more than succeed, excel in in Lincoln's system. But uh, I think that if he was going to leave in the last two or three years, it would have been for one of those two other jobs and, and you know, re run it back with Kyler or Baker as opposed to Jalen. I don't know. Maybe they were thinking that Lincoln Financial Field, Lincoln could, you know, get a big uh, sponsorship <laughs> deal, sweeten that contract a little bit, something like that. Maybe, maybe. Um, Lincoln right now is making six and a half. By the end of, by the middle of this contract, he's going to be making about seven million a year. His con- his uh, salary in twenty twenty six and a half million is more than Doug Peterson was making. That's what's been reported today, this week. Um, so he's not leaving for less money. No, no, he's not leaving for the same money. He's not leaving for a little bit more money. Uh, plus this team, as we talked about in the opening segment, they got a real shot at a national championship run next year. Um, he's not going. He's not going, okay? But the headline here is not that Lincoln Riley's thinking about going to the Eagles or Lincoln Riley is uh, considering the No, it's that the Eagles called him. They literally said, Lincoln, hey, what's up? You want an NFL job? Um, you want to come to the East Coast? You want to move your young family to the city of brotherly love? That's what Ed Kratz reported. He's the publisher of the SI Network site that covers the Eagles, Eagle Maven. Uh, and I have no doubt that what he reported is 100% accurate. The Eagles reached out to Lincoln Riley, but he's not leaving. I've said it before. If he leaves OU, it'll be for the Dallas Cowboys. Sorry. Yes, it's true. And here's why. Lincoln trained Stephen Jones' son, Jerry's, uh, you know, Jerry's grandson. And they, they have the, he has a great relationship with the Joneses. And Jerry obviously isn't above hiring someone that he's very fond of prof- personally and professionally. So, But no, listen, I'll say it again. Lincoln's not going to coach the Philadelphia Eagles. He's smarter than that. Not only is he making more money at OU, but what kind of job security do you have at a place like Oklahoma right now where you're 45-8, and eight, four Big 12 titles in four years, compared to a place that just fired a guy that won the Super Bowl Less than three years ago. I mean, come on. Give Lincoln Riley a little more credit than that. Um, Ryan, another OU coach was in the news this week. Former OU coach anyway. Bob Stoops made the College Football Hall of Fame. 190 wins, 10 Big 12 titles in 18 years. Won the 2000 national title, obviously. Every BCS bowl game, right? But Ryan, what are your thoughts on Bob Stoops' College Football Hall of Fame? First ballot. Pretty impressive and kind of a no-brainer for me. Yeah, I think the real news here, John, would have been if he wasn't inducted to the Hall of Fame on the first ballot. You can't deny his coaching record, everything that he accomplished at Oklahoma. But even before then, you know, what he did as a part of that Kansas State staff and in Florida as the defensive coordinator, like everywhere Bob Stoops went, he um, excelled, he made the program better, and they achieved new heights after he was gone. Uh, rather than when he was there. So it's a no brainer that that's kind of, you know, I know people will ding him, um, not necessarily in Norman, but, but around the country, well, you made how many national championships and you only had one, but no other program across Bob Stoops, entire career was as consistent at a high level as Oklahoma and the ship that Bob Stoops was in command of. So it's obviously well-earned, Hopefully he will enjoy that trip to Atlanta whenever it happens after all this blows over. And uh, like I said, it it would have been more newsworthy. I feel like if, if he wasn't inducted on the first ballot. Yeah. He'll be in, uh, in New York city in December. He goes to that thing anyway, every year, I think, or he did when he was the head coach. 
uh, for the induction ceremony. And then the actual um, enshrinement will be in Atlanta, uh, I think next spring, 2022. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, um, there's a couple of elements of Bob Stoops' tenure at Oklahoma that get him into the Hall of Fame that don't get talked about enough, Ryan. Number one, guy did it the right way. Um, I, I remember when he passed Barry Switzer on the, for OU's all time, you know, wins list, uh, all time, most wins in career in uh, OU history. Uh, I wrote a column saying that he did it the right way. And Bob called me and told me the next day, he said, somebody put my, somebody put your column, your newspaper on my chair. And I read it. Thank you for saying that you're right. Here's what he said. Here's what he did. He did it the right way by being on NCA probation one time, one time, one violation. And what happened during that one violation? It was his Johnny Five Star quarterback, Rhett Bomar. And Bob responded by kicking his ass off the team, right? Uh, we're talking about Rhett Bomar, the number one player in the country, the five star recruit, the, the highest. He's still to this day, I think, the third highest ranked recruit in OU history, maybe second behind Adrian Peterson. Um, I'm trying to think. I think that's right. I think he's second or third. But that's how, that's the kind of promise and potential that Rhett Bomar had. Bob Stoops, you're going to break NCAA rules on my on my watch. I don't care if you're a walk on receiver or a backup offensive lineman or the five star quarterback. He kicked all three of those dudes off the team. So you got to admire his you know his, doing the job with integrity, an extremely high level of integrity. And then number two for me is kind of number one if you think about it. Uh, the real legacy of Bob Stoops. I told I was on the the phone or the radio with Mike Steely from the Sports Animal Tulsa, and I said, "Think about what that campus looked like in 1998 before Stoops arrived. The OU campus. You transport yourself now into that period. Would you might not recognize the place? It doesn't look anything like it because he changed the entire landscape, literally, of the physical OU campus." He ignited by winning that first season, turning it around, getting out of the doldrums, and then second season winning the national championship. He basically got millionaire and billionaire donors to line up and say, Joe Stiglione, David Boren, Bob Stoops, what can I do for you? They were standing in line to give OU money to build something, to construct something. And, and look at that campus now. That's all Bob Stoops, guys. I know David Bourne gets a lot of credit for that, but without the football team winning at an extremely high level, that money does not come in, and that campus is not as beautiful as it is now. Um, and all, they don't have all the facilities, and they're not competing like they are. Up next on the SI Sooners podcast, we got transfer portal news. One going out and one, maybe, possibly, coming in. Hey, are you a business owner looking to get your product out there to the masses? Let's say you run a hotel in Norman or a car dealership in Oklahoma City or a restaurant in Edmond. Or maybe you're a small online business who creates and sells OU merchandise and you just want Sooner Nation to come sample your wares. Well, then consider advertising in this space right here on the SI Sooners podcast. SI Sooners reaches thousands of readers, viewers, and listeners literally every day. And the SI Sooners podcast is the ideal place to find your next customer. To advertise, send an email to allsoonerssi at gmail.com or DM us on Twitter at all underscore Sooners. Final segment of the SI Sooners podcast. We're, um, we're going to get to the transfer portal news in just a second. But, uh, but Ryan, big week for OU basketball. Obviously, they lost a close one at Kansas Last Saturday, then they come back home and just annihilated TCU last night. Now they've got Oklahoma State in Stillwater on Saturday night, 7 o'clock. Ryan, they went 1-3 and three against those four ranked teams, uh, but they put up a couple of good fights, and I thought they really flexed their muscle last night, especially defensively against TCU. Yeah, and not only did they go 1-3, and three, they went 1-3 and three kind of having to deal with a little bit of COVID issue, things like that, as Brady Manick and Jalen Hill – um, they missed the Kansas game and that TCU game with COVID protocols. But the, the real story is, I guess, I don't know, they were inspired by Alex Grinch and the defense and their performance in the Cotton Bowl because they've come out at the turn of the new year and just been suffocating on the defensive end. It didn't go their way at Fog Allen Fieldhouse against the Jayhawks, but they came back to Norman and absolutely embarrassed TCU. And, and that's what 
they're going to have to do, not necessarily win by 40 every night, John, but they just need to carry that level of defense the rest of the way. Is it going to be enough for them to topple a bunch of these top 10 teams the second time they roll around? No, but they will be able to steal one or two more games against ranked opponents and sweep some of these bottom-end Big 12 teams. If they play like that, they're going to beat Kansas State twice. They're going to have a great shot to beat Iowa State twice. They're going to have a really good chance to split this Bedlam series, and, and that's the recipe for success, for this team to make it to the NCAA tournament, to go hole up in Indianapolis for a month. You know That's exactly what they need to happen, and it's just all the more impressive that they did it with Brady Manick exiting the lineup. So yeah, Ryan. Last night, um, after OU finished off TCU, I flipped the flipped the switch on my uh, my ESPN Plus app, and I watched the second half of Kansas at Oklahoma State. So, yeah, Bill Self obviously still has problems with his alma mater. Uh, who knows when that's going to end? But 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 last night in Stillwater was weird. KU falls behind by sixteen, then they appear you know to have finished it off, come all the way back, um, close the game on like a, I don't know twenty twenty to two run something like that. They took a three point lead in the final minute, but then Oklahoma State, out of nowhere, they get life again. Likely hits a big three, and then uh, Cunningham gets a steal, fast break, three-pointer the other way, three-point play. They scored the last eight points of the game, and they beat Kansas. So, Ryan, given the scope of what we saw last night, Oklahoma TCU, Oklahoma State, Kansas, give me a Bedlam prediction. What do you think happens on Saturday night in Stillwater? Yeah, I mean, John, I think this is going to be a really great game. It's really hard for me. I don't see either road team in this Bedlam series this year unless there's some awful, you know, uh, players missing games due to contact tracing or injury or anything. Obviously don't want any of that. But I think both home teams are probably going to hold in this. I imagine a pretty low-scoring game, though, the way the Sooners have been playing. But I'd take Oklahoma State, you know, 68, 64, 65, somewhere in there. Uh, you know, the book on Mike Boyton is, it's been really incredible, John. They seem to have, you know, this really young team for like five straight years or however long Boyton's been in Stillwater <laughs> who can never get it going. This year, this young team has the talent, though. They are one of the most talented teams in college basketball. They're just all incredibly young and trying to work through it. So that's a big win for Oklahoma State, learning how to win with Cade Cunningham and likely being that guy. So I think it's going to be a hard-fought battle, but uh, I just don't see the Sooners getting out of Stillwater on top of this one. Okay, transfer portal news broke just today. Um, Grant Calcaterra, first of all, lands at SMU. That happened like right when we were getting ready to prep for the podcast. Grant Calcaterra to SMU. He will be reunited with Tanner Mordecai. How about that? Um, so Grant Calcaterra, let's see. He retired, was going to be a firefighter. Then he unretired and announced he was going to play again. Then he announced that he was going to Auburn. Then he announced that he was not going to Auburn. Gus Malzahn got fired. Then he announced today that he's going to SMU. So he's kind of making the rounds a little bit. Um, also, earlier today, John Michael Terry announced on Twitter that he would uh, he's going to play next year at Tulsa, University of Tulsa. So here's this is weird today, Ryan. I saw this news, came across his Twitter feed, and I was like, oh, hey, I need to write that up. I'll get it posted. But then the more I looked at John Michael Terry's Twitter, the more I hesitated. As a, as a reporter, you know, as a news outlet, right, I join, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm like, wait a minute, I need to look a little deeper into this. This, is, this doesn't look like your typical tweet that these guys are saying, like, like Calcaterra's, I'm going to SMU. Just didn't look right. So I, joined, you know, I, I looked up the, some stuff, John Michael Terry joined Twitter in December of 2020, huh? He's got 138 followers, hmm? and and the only people that he followed before recently announcing his uh, his transfer, the only people that he followed were OU football players. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, all right. You start to see a bunch of coaches and personnel people that you know from around the country. Tulsa had a couple that followed him back because he followed them, right? He followed them back. They follow him because that's what trolls do on Twitter now. They're very sophisticated. And so I was like, okay, now hang on, hang on, hang on. What's going on? I immediately took down our story. I, I deleted my tweet. I reached out to four sources that I have at the University of Tulsa, right? Uh, two of them got back to me pretty quick, confirmed it for me. Yes, John Michael Terry, the Tulsa kid, is going to finish his career at TU. Great fit for him. He's going to be able to play that outside linebacker spot where Zaven Collins just became, you know, the National Player of the Year is all, first-team All-American. 
Um, plus, TU just got another kid from Tulsa, uh, Owen Ostrowski. He committed after, I think he was committed to Air Force. TU didn't even af- offer him, even though his dad is you know probably one of the top five players in TU history and works for the university. They still didn't offer him until just recently. So anyway, good fit for John Michael Terry. He's a former OU starter. I want to say something about this kid. Six games he started in 2019, then he broke his leg. He was the starter, not Nick Benito. He started the first six games of the season, kept Nick Benito on the bench, right? Then Benito comes in, plays well at the end of 20, 2019, wins the job in 2020, and guess what? He becomes an All-American. I mean, that's how good, guys, John Michael Terry was playing under Alex Grinch, Ryan. Yeah, and like you said, I think it's a really great fit because it's a defensive scheme equipped for – exactly what his skill set is he's gonna slot right in there and this is just a really good move this is what i think the transfer portal was put in for for guys that look he had he unfortunately through to a, a, an injury had an opportunity he was playing good football the injury took that away and at a place like oklahoma if you get injured through no fault of your own, you could be completely out of a job just because someone else that's just as talented as you can step in and, and take that and launch themselves into a whole nother stratosphere. It's exactly what Nick Benito did. So it's a great fit for John Michael Terry scheme wise, obviously headed back home to Tulsa. Um, it, it, this is exactly what the transfer portal's for. So I just hope people remember for every story that you roll your eyes, for every one of those, for every time that Austin Kendall hits the portal, just think back to John Michael Terry and say, okay, this is what it's for. Sure, there are going to be some guys that, that don't utilize it correctly or, or make poor choices, but I, I'm just glad that John Michael Terry is going to get a, a second chance here in football to go out and be that big time star that, you know, we feel like he could be. And that Ostrowski kid, John, I just got to say, um, I had the privilege of being on the radio call for his state championship game. He is an absolute monster. I expect him to contribute right away wherever he was going to end up. And at Tulsa, um, you know, who better than, than to say, look, they're going to go ahead and wall around the state and say, look, if SMU can bring all those people back in through the portal, why can't we? So I really love what Tulsa's doing and a great pair of pickups for the Golden Hurricane. Let's look at some of the transfers, Ryan. Um, like the question, I guess, who's going to be the most successful? You got Tanner Mordecai at SMU, okay, uh, playing in Sonny Dykes' system. Cool. You got Chandler Morris at uh, TCU. He's going to be working down there under Gary Gary Patterson, um, don't know if he's going to win the job yet. He's got an incumbent starter and three recruits that are coming in in the 21 class. Um, you got TJ Pledger at Utah. Sounds good. He could probably do some damage there. You got Charleston Rambo at Miami, University of Miami, the U, right? So now you've got John Michael Terry at Tulsa. Ryan, um, now listen, every one of those guys except Morris was at one point a, either a starter or was competing for the starting job, or at least in Tanner Mordecai's case, he was he thought he was competing for the starting job. Wasn't going to beat out Rattler ever. So you know, I think fans are looking, a lot of OU fans right now are saying, ah, those guys are our cast-offs. We're not going to miss them. I call BS on that. I think those guys, you know, Rambo could have held on to the football a little more, sure. Pledger probably could have broken some tackles here or there against Iowa State and Kansas State. Yes, of course. Um Terry probably could have made a few more plays on defense. I think he missed a big tackle at Iowa State, if I remember right. I'm not sure. Anyway, those guys are good players, Ryan. So who's going to benefit the most from a change of scenery with those five guys, do you think? Yeah, so I think the the most obvious one for me, and I know that he has the biggest uphill battle as far as winning the job, but I, I believe that Chandler Morris is a really talented quarterback, and he just – wasn't ever going to get any run unless some weird stuff happened, I think, because of Spencer Rattler and Caleb Williams and all that. So I think that he'll be great for TCU. I think he could actually be the key for TCU to kind of rebound from the, they were, you know, uh, a, a part of the Big 12 championship game, obviously the very first one. Then they've kind of been a middling team. I, I think that's the one person we kind of talked about, John Michael Terry. But the other one guy I think this is going to be really good for is TJ Pledger. Look, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the situation he's walking into, Utah, very, very tragic. Their freshman running back, um, you know, Pac-12 freshman of the year, what went home over the winter break, and, and tragically he was he was shot and killed. And so that's a program that um, TJ Pledger, all you hear is great things about him out of Norm, about how hard he's worked. 
he's going to go and walk in and, and he's a huge need for that program. And I think that he's going to be able to um, contribute as we saw here in Norman. And I think he'll be a big lift to Utah because um, obviously incredibly tragic situation that's gone on there, but um, maybe the play of TJ Pledger can help uplift that offense a little bit. Um, Rambo, I honestly, John, I think that uh, Miami is the perfect fit for him. They're, they're two, uh, you know, two entities that haven't necessarily lived up to their billing recently and Rambo this season in Miami since, you know, 2002. So I feel like that makes a lot of sense, but I really feel like Pledger, John Michael Terry and Chandler Morris could be the guys that uh, have big years uh, coming out of this transfer portal experience. I think that's a stretch on Chandler Morris. I think uh, Terry is going to be a star at Tulsa. They're going to allow him <clears throat> an opportunity to be a playmaker on that defense. Um, I'm not sure if Rambo is the guy that we all thought he was or that he thought he was. Um, so maybe if there's a, there's a alpha receiver there in Miami for him to kind of play alongside kind of a Batman Robin situation, I think he'll be okay. Pledger, I agree. Ty Jordan's death was unbelievably tragic, just awful, awful thing. Um, so yeah, he's going to have an opportunity there. And, and I agree that his addition is going to be something that maybe can help pick up the team a little bit, but Tanner Mordecai, if he's, if he's good enough to win the job, I don't know what their quarterback situation is. I think Mordecai in a, in a wide open offense is going to stand out. Um, so who we, we mentioned the transfer portal and we mentioned the possibility of somebody coming in. Who's it going to be? Who's coming into Oklahoma? Listen, nothing's been announced yet, nothing official, nothing formal. But we expect at some point in the very near future that a guy by the name of Wanye Morris will find himself a home outside the transfer portal. He officially entered the portal today, we're told. Uh, we were told last week to keep an eye on it. We had a story on Wanye Morris last week, uh, kind of an in-depth, uh, here's what he's thinking kind of story, because it came across the, uh, the, the SI network, the Tennessee website, that covers uh, the Vols. Um, we were told that Wanye Morris is in the market for the transfer portal and that Oklahoma would be in the market for Wanye Morris. He is an offensive tackle at Tennessee, started two years for the Vols. He's a former five-star recruit from Georgia. Ryan, I think the kid would fit in nicely behind what R.J. Proctor did for a year, what Chris Murray has done or tried to do for a half a year. Um, guys who were starters somewhere else, you know, Virginia and, and uh, UCLA, but they wanted to transfer to OU because they wanted to play for Bill Biedenboe. Yeah, and I mean, this is a guy that I feel like he's kind of on uh, a, another level than, than maybe Proctor was, kind of similar to, to Chris Murray. This is a guy that came in playing, you know, tackle in that vaunted SEC, and not only that, he was a standout. He he was, you know, laid all conference honors at his feet by the conference, things like that. So this is not just a okay, this is a five-star player who came in and, you know, no one really saw that five-star ability, maybe needs to change the scenery. That is not what is happening from all accounts it, it, surrounding the Tennessee program. It seems like there's just an exodus because, you know, maybe they should have gone with Shiano and not let everyone run him out of town before he even took over, things like that. Like, it's just a dumpster fire there in Knoxville, it seems like. But this would be a welcome addition to the Sooners. It's a position that they definitely need to fill after missing out on Tristan Lee and, and all the drama that surrounded that. They need a tackle. They really need a running back in the transfer portal. So this would be not just, you know, hey, check that box, get another tackle on the team. This would be a guy that could come in and threaten to start from day one. So I don't know what more you could ask for in the world of the transfer portal. Hey, big game in the NFL on Sunday. Baker Mayfield versus Patrick Mahomes. Um, I don't expect 125 points and 1,700 yards of offense like those guys did in Lubbock back in 2016. But it's going to be a fun game. Uh, I'm looking forward. got my DVR set. I uh, can't wait to watch that one. Um, I'll have something previewing that game on the website later this week, allsooners.com. And we told you about the new series coming up, um, the 2020 report cards, right? Well, we got another one coming up on recruiting, and I think it's going to be an extremely fun read for you guys. Listen to the SI Sooners podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts, or on your Amazon-enabled device. Just say, Alexa, play the SI Sooners podcast. Or go to our website, allsooners.com, click on the player, and listen on your phone, your tablet, your computer, whatever. Or you can always watch the video version on my YouTube channel. 
John Hoover Media. For Ryan Chapman, I'm John Hoover. See you guys.